All of which brings us to the present day. There was a time in our not so distant Western history when the spires of our churches and cathedrals were the highest in the land. Church spires stood out and could be seen for miles around. Indeed, they were designed for that very purpose, to be noticed, to be central, to show that God was at the center of Western civilization, or at least that he should be. Then things changed. The Industrial Revolution happened. Industry and technology happened. These are not, not bad things in themselves, of course not. On the contrary, they're actually blessings from God. Unfortunately, as so often happens, when people abound in material blessings, there is a tendency to focus so much on the blessings that they forget God. In other words, as a people develop in terms of progress and technology, at the same time they degenerate spiritually. It's also interesting that Babel's sin and pride also occurred at a time of great technological development. Now at the time of the Industrial Revolution in the latter 19th century, an interesting phenomenon took place. In due course, the buildings of the new world of industry started to overtake the old spires and cathedrals of the more Christian era. Churches and cathedrals had been the tallest buildings in the world from the 13th century to the year 1894. The concept of the skyscraper was conceived in 1884, and within 10 years the old cathedral spire was no longer the highest point in the land. Soon after that, we began to enter the age of the modern skyscraper. These were erected chiefly for commerce and industry. In 1930, the Chrysler Building became the tallest building in the world. This held the record for only 11 months and was overtaken by the Empire State Building in 1931. In 1973, the World Trade Center went up, claiming the new record. This was almost saying, almost as if the spirit of the city was shouting out that God was no longer the center of worship of the West, that the focus of the new man was now on mammon, self, pleasure, the gods of humanism. We are reminded of Babel with its proud tower that seemed to reach the heavens, or perhaps scrape the sky. Perhaps no coincidence that skyscraper is the name we chose to describe the new superstructure. Buildings that scrape the sky touch the heavens. Of course, they're not literally touching the heavens, but there's a loose sense here, perhaps again on an unconscious or even spiritual level, where these magnificent edifices almost seem to probe at the heavenly realm, to challenge God at his own game, as it were. In this sense, perhaps the Tower of Babel and the modern secular skyscraper have more in common than we might first think. An architectural think tank held in Poland only this year finds curious parallels between so-called secular architecture and the more spiritual idea of a temple. It's interesting that the think tank organizers perceived the secular building as carrying something of the spirit of the temple of old. Here they make a very interesting observation. The traditional religious meaning of Tao as axis mundi, axis of the universe connecting heaven and earth, coexists with the secular meaning of Tao as a sign of organized society. It is an inseparable element of urban landscape. Throughout the history, the symbolic meaning of Tao didn't change. It is still a symbol of rule, abilities of a human being, of permanent growth and achieving a symbolic heaven. It is a reflection of social structure, spiritual domination, church tower secular, town hall tower, skyscrapers of international corporations, and so on. On the subject of communism and indeed capitalism having become substitute religions in the modern world, the organizers also make a very interesting observation on the religious impulse behind buildings in both the communist and the capitalist eras. The Palace of Culture and Science in Warsaw had religious meaning too. It was connected with a religion called communism. The palace was a controversial gift from Soviet leader Joseph Stalin to the people of Warsaw. It's a huge steel and ceramic tile socialist realist skyscraper. The architecture of a building is closely related to many similar skyscrapers built in the Soviet Union, especially in Moscow at that time. Nowadays, the religion of liberal capitalism, with its huge skyscrapers, 
start to compete with the enormous height of the palace. For more details on communism as a substitute religion that merely replaced Christianity and Russia of old, see my recent blog cast, The Removing of the Lampstand. Perhaps then the West has simply gone from one religion to another, as it were, having simply exchanged the Christian religion for the more secular religion of mammon and pleasure. Look at any skyscraper-laden cityscape of the modern city today. You would be hard-pressed to find a single church spire among them. Instead, you see a layer of skyscrapers pressing toward the sky, as did Babel of old. It's clear that the game plan has changed. The face and central focus of society has changed. It's gone from God being at the center to mammon and commerce as being the main focal point. In other words, although the erectors and conceivers of the modern metropolis, with its glistening buildings that seem to touch the sky, weren't consciously thinking of religion or God when they designed the said cityscape, on the level of the unconscious, or even the spiritual, a very definite statement was being made. And the modern concept of the high-rise skyscraper, in fact, conveys a spiritual message not dissimilar to the cathedral or temple. In the language of modern humanism, some might say the religion of humanism, is saying a great deal indeed. In short, Western society has gone from centering on God to centering on the God of mammon, to use Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. No, I'm not saying let's get rid of skyscrapers. I'm simply pointing to an interesting phenomenon that is both sociological and spiritual. I'm not saying get rid of the buildings. I'm saying let's revitalize the Christian spirits in society which will in turn express material achievements in more godly ways. Another interesting observation. British MP Tony Benn, commenting on the original 1965 construction of the post office tower, makes a similar observation. Gazing out across London from the tower, he comments on St. Paul's Cathedral in the Bank of England, which happened to be situated right next to each other. He says, And you see the whole city and all its various monuments, there's St. Paul's Cathedral, where they worship God. And next to it is the Bank of England, where they worship money. And of course, all buildings symbolize for people what it is they really worship. And I suppose today society worships communication. Television, radio, mobile phones, internet. It is communication that symbolizes this period of civilization, combined with the money man. We've already looked at the Empire State Building, which went up in 1931. Just two years later saw the release of the legendary film King Kong. Of course, the film tells the tale of a giant ape that comes from a distant, uncharted island and is brought to New York City only to wreak mayhem and destruction. The famous climax to the film occurs when Kong, having escaped from his human captors, scales the Empire State and is only brought down when the military are called in armed with their latest technologies, such as they were then. Is the film saying something about civilization versus barbarism? Is it perhaps also making a statement that questions the mightiest accomplishments made by the hand of man? That even at the height of our pride and prowess, when we think we might be on the verge of some kind of human utopia, that we may not have accounted for the darker ravagings of human nature, to come up and threaten to destroy all that we've worked for. The film almost seems to be saying, hang on, mighty Western world, you think you've accomplished great feats. You think you've touched the sky with your skyscrapers and new technologies. But maybe you're not as great as you think you are. Maybe the beast-like nature that lurks at the heart of every human being on Earth is very much alive. You might think you've got it isolated in some remote corner of the human subconscious, but just when you least expect it, it's going to rise up to the pinnacle of all the pomp and greatness you hold dear, of all your mightiest technologies and towering achievements that you wave in the face of God. That was just two years after the Empire State went up, just after it became the talk of the town and the tallest building in the world. Not forgetting that only a few years before this, the Great Depression had begun, an event that cast a vast shadow in all the claims of man to produce a happy state through economics, industry, and the modern system. The famed 2005 version of King Kong was released just four years after the events of 
when a different sort of barbarism took down the Twin Towers, which for a time had also held the record for the world's tallest building. Perhaps on some unconscious or even spiritual level, there's a message here for us today, for the humanity that dares vaunt itself toward the sky, almost as of challenging God himself. In terms of penetrating the heavens, the 1960s also saw man first penetrate the veil of space when Yuri Gagarin became the first man to penetrate through the atmosphere and into outer space beyond. This was duly followed by the 1969 Apollo moon landing with its quote, one giant leap for mankind. I wonder if there's also a sense here of a symbolic victory for humanism, a sense of, like Babel, reaching the heavens, God's domain in a sense. That is, that man's conquest of space might be seen in some symbolic way of humanism conquering the heavens, as it were. Certainly this might be one of the ideas in the 1968 film 2001 A Space Odyssey. Again, I'm not anti-technology, nor am I condemning the space race. I'm simply noting a sociological phenomenon and suggesting that we look at dealing with the spirit behind it. But let's take a look now at events of more recent memory. Before we examine the recent fire at Notre Dame Cathedral, let's consider another tragic event that took place at another megastructure, the Twin Towers. On September the 11th, 2001, the World Trade Center and its towers suffered what is undoubtedly the most infamous terrorist attack in history at the hands of Al-Qaeda. But when we look behind the physical, at the spiritual, we find ourselves asking why God allowed it to happen. Was there perhaps a spiritual rationale behind it? Well, you can often tell the reason for a judgment by in fact looking at the judgment itself. A righteous judgment will always reflect the crime or sin behind it. In other words, the judgment is a clue as to the sin that brought it about. The subject of the attack was tellingly a pair of towers. As we have seen, the Bible, of course, has a lot to say about towers. And what are the towers of the World Trade Center? Simply the world center of commerce, the central focus of a world that had exchanged the age-old church spire for towers that reached the heavens, as it were. What 9-11 as a judgment could represent, then, is a judgment on a society that had exchanged the true God for the God of Mammon. Whereas God was once at the center, now it is the self and its pleasures. Once again, the book of Revelation provides us with a clue. Chapter 18, dealing with the collapse of the mighty city Babylon, tells us, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. The merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries, and give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart, she boasts, I sit enthroned as a queen. She will be consumed by fire. It also tells us, the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, because no one buys their cargoes anymore, cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple silk, and scarlet cloth. Like the Babylon of Revelation, the modern West has become as a city so wrapped up in its own luxury, commerce, and pleasure-oriented goods that it has left God far behind. The judgment here is a judgment on a world that has made commerce and mammon its God. That is, the judgment is focused specifically on a city absorbed in commerce and the decadence so often associated with that. It is a judgment aimed directly at the God of mammon. What was 9-11? a judgment on the great towers that had become the center of commerce in a post-Christian Western world that was slowly, surely, losing its focus on God as the center of its world and existence. That is, the nature of the judgment tells us something about the reason behind it and the message that God was trying to convey.